following the Declaration of Independence nurtured a new breed of community in a world of confusion. Repudiating precedent and usage dominating old world states which had evolved slowly, painfully, and planlessly from preceding things, these Americans, for history's first time, planned and made a nation. And then in New York City on April 30th, 1789, they named a leader to complete the structure on the foundation of that new nation's fundamental law. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Gentlemen, before we get to business, we have the pleasure, perhaps mixed with sadness, of saying hail and farewell to one who deserves all the affection and respect of his country. Well, that description can fit only one man. Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Mr. President. We should have preferred going to you, Dr. Franklin, to pay our respects. Not so. I deemed it more fitting the shoe be on the other foot. Hmm. General Knox, I've seen the day when your buff and blue was blood blotched. That John Adams might become the first vice president of these United States. <laughs> and you, James Madison, our children's children will remember you. And you, Alex Hamilton. And you, John Jay. And you, Mr. Randolph. Tomorrow I leave for Philadelphia, where in my daughter's house I shall spend such time as allotted me beyond my present 83 years. Those have been eventful years, Dr. Franklin. I have watched that Constitution growing like a tree from first the sprout planted by Samuel Adams and his correspondence committees. And then, the united action of the Association of 1774. In the history of this nation, there is deserved an honorable page for that association. That was the trunk. And those articles were the trunk's first branches. And then the branches lifted up and spread into a sturdy tree of liberty with shade enough for all. And the first sprout from the seed sown by our ancestors and nurtured by their blood. Seen, Dr. Franklin, that such a Bill of Rights was not included in our Constitution through deliberate design. And they will, most likely, next stir up suspicion. And accusation will follow close upon suspicion. The proofs, of course, to be collected in some future time. some individuals to see instances of guilt where there is at most only honest error. <laughs> you, Dr. Franklin, perfectly describe those who claim that during ratification's debate, the Constitution's sponsors proceeded on the theory that the means justify the ends. The true measure of any action is the sentiment from which it springs. The quality of means determines the ethics of ends. Honesty will justify our means, and history will, I trust, applaud our ends. Gentlemen, men were never before called upon to perform duties of such responsibility as those confronting you. And you, sir, begin a task which some wise men predict cannot successfully be accomplished and every aspiring absolute ruler prays that you will fail. I am of the opinion that there are other men more competent than I to complete this task. I am too old for a bad example, so I may give advice to you, sir, 
more than any man, this nation owes its freedom. And to you, sir, more than any man, the people give both affection and confidence. How can you fail? If the government we organize under the people's constitution survives the next 20 years, it may go on forever. My friend, it will survive. And in times of future tribulation, may no American forget that his liberty thrives on the principle that all men are created equal. Gentlemen, goodbye, and good luck to you. With orderly efficiency, the first government was formed. John Jay became the first Chief Justice. And, by general accord, Madison became leader of the House. Then a cabinet of secretaries, rather than ministers, was appointed. Hamilton, Treasury, Knox, War, Randolph, Attorney General, Jefferson, Foreign Affairs. Thomas Jefferson's duties in France will keep this chair vacant, I fear, for months. The seeds of liberty scattering from here take root in Europe. The people mutter and establish systems which is nothing but disaster. From Paris, Jefferson expresses the sophistry of a dying order. The Americans declare that all men are created equal, with unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is evident that these are very questionable statements. Men are not born equal. Men are not born free. These statements are so manifestly false that it is impossible to believe that the men who made them believed in them. <laughs> <laughs> Such truths are beyond the understanding of minds lacking imagination and must, perforce, be denied by designing dictation. We declare that unhampered intellect is the natural state decreed by man's creator. They oppose a most unnatural state, a hampering social net decreed by man's stupidity. A net which may enmesh but cannot stifle fundamental truths which confound archaic systems that degrade the individual in exaltation of the state. From those truths springs the American concept of liberty motivating every article in the Constitution, which I have sworn to defend, and which your able pen so well defended in the argument of ratification. I think the world suspects that these widely translated treatises on civil government credited to Publius would better read by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. To some, our pens still seem to lack conviction. Their rambling oratory demands that the Constitution's preamble be changed to read, not we the people, but we the states. I am sure that to a majority of our people, that question has already lost much of its significance. And if a Bill of Rights be, without delay, adopted, it will have no significance at all. Mr. Madison, the Constitution is itself, to every useful purpose, a Bill of Rights. Right. There was not a delegate, you'll agree, at the Constitutional Convention who had the least objection to what is asked now by 